war against Ukraine. My name is Eleonora Tafura Ambrosetti. I'm a research fellow with the Russia, Caucasus and Central Asia Center here at ISPI. And uh, today I'm joined by two distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Neil Melvin, uh, the Director of International Security Studies at the Royal United Services Institute in the UK, RUSI. Um, Dr. Melvin uh, focuses on emerging uh, international security dynamics in uh, several key areas of the world. He's also served um, as an advisor in many international organizations such as the uh, OSCE, uh, the UN and the Energy Charter. Uh, welcome Neil. We have also uh, Dr. Uh, Mikhail Minakov, uh, he's uh, an associate fellow here at ISPI, uh, but he's also a senior fellows, uh, fellow at the Kennan Institute and the editor-in-chief uh, of the Kennan Focus on Ukraine and also at the Ideology and, Polit and Politics Journal. Hi, Mikhail. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Sure, our pleasure. Um, as you know, uh, this is a new format here at ISPI. It's a 30-minute conversation uh, with two guests and uh, we're going to have a short but meaningful uh, conversation in which we will try to include also your questions. So feel free uh, to uh, reach out to us through our social media. Um, but um, let's start uh, with Mikhail um, because I'd, I'd like uh, to ask you for uh, a general assessment of the situation on the ground. Uh, this is a, a war of information as well, it's not just uh, uh, fought with uh, weapons uh, but uh, with, uh, with the media and with the information as well and it's quite difficult also to, to grasp uh, exactly what's happening on the ground. So uh, why don't you start giving us your assessment of uh, the military and diplomatic developments. Thank, Thank you, Laura. Well, well uh, it's, it's 27th, 27th day, day of the, of the war, war that, that Russia, Russia launched on Ukraine. Ukraine. First, in the first se several days, there was definitely a plan for fast regime change. But because of many different uh, aspects, due to resistance of the army and of the society, due to brave behavior of President Zelensky, and due to miscalculations of Kremlin, this plan was not fulfilled. Today we see that the uh, Russian army is stalled on most of the directions. Russian troops uh, entered on the Ukrainian soil from Belarus in the north, heading for Kyiv. And in this direction, Kyiv uh, resists pretty well, especially in, in the recent days when Russian troops on the right bank were moved slowly to, retreated slowly to closer to the Belarus border. Uh, on the left bank uh, near Kyiv, there, there are heavy battles going on, but also resistance and defense is quite good. And uh, in two weeks, Russia didn't change the situation very much in that direction. If we look at the uh, armies that entered Ukrainian soil in the east, near Sumy, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, these big cities, they are... Uh, still defending themselves pretty successfully. People can leave or uh, new reinforcements can enter these cities. Uh, although this change of the plans have led Kremlin to the, to the launch of groundwork, conventional work, which leads to thousands of uh, killed among civilians and the defenders. The, this organization of this war, the preparations for this war is definitely was definitely trapped on the 2014 experience. So they were still thinking that Ukrainian army is non-reformed, that uh, the society is split around political agenda, which is wrong. But there were even more miscalculations uh, made by Kremlin. So the, the army, the Russian army, which is believed to be number two in the world, showed itself pretty much uh, inefficient with many, uh, it's not yet clear in exact numbers, but with many uh, Russian soldiers and officers killed. This figure of six generals being killed is also enormous, which is much more than the death toll among these chief officers in the Chechen war. 
but also politically from in diplomatic and international relations, Russia has turned into a pariah state. If we look back at the UN decision, 141 states supported the uh, the decision uh, condemning the Russian uh, invasion. At the same time, uh, there's no no any no ground for euphoria. So the war is going uglier. There is hope, though, that the consultations they are not really fully fledged talks right now, but the consultations between Moscow and Kiev. Uh, continue to go on. On at this track, uh, two armies uh, have managed to create some kind of model that permits the populations in the cities under shelling to leave. Civilians could leave through humanitarian corridors. These cities, and in 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 last ten to fourteen days, it looks like this track works well. But in terms of armistice or finding political solutions. No, this trick is not ready. And to finish, I would uh, probably say that a Turkey's foreign minister, Mevlut Cavusoglu, uh, has claimed that uh, on March 20, so two days ago, that a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine is close, I cited here. Well, dis despite the skepticism, mine or many other uh, experts, uh, Kyiv was said to be willing to change its constitution to abandon aspirations to join NATO with Turkey, Germany, and five permanent members of UN Security Council to act as guarantees. Probably at this uh, level, th there is some hope. But again, uh, these uh, consultations are still at a very early stage. I'll stop at this. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's very interesting what you remark both on the number of uh, uh, casualties among uh, Russian soldiers, because these numbers are really, really uh, different, uh, whether you look at the Ukrainian or the Pentagon's uh, assessment, or if you look at the Russian Ministry uh, of Defense, right? They range between, um, I don't know, a few hundreds uh, uh, to 9,000, which was uh, one of the latest figures that that we have and also it's very interesting that you highlight the role of Turkey uh, for Turkey this is um, very much uh, uh, an important matter and uh, probably also um, an occasion to, uh, to, to, to to depict its, uh, itself as a, as a mediator and to boost its uh, demo diplomatic uh, role um, but I'd like to uh, turn to Neil uh, because I'd like to talk about another important state uh, in this conflict. Uh, the uh, UK has been uh, showing its, uh, its support to Ukraine, both uh, sending weapons and imposing very harsh sanctions on, on Russia. So how do you evaluate uh, the role of the UK and what uh, do you think uh, uh, are the consequences and implications of this uh, conflict uh, for uh, the, um, the British foreign policy in the post-Brexit scenario. Hi Eleanor, and thanks very much for the invitation to join. As you say, the UK's had, a, had a, a very clear and quite strong line on Ukraine, and that really dates actually from 2014, uh, Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea and, and its uh, involvement in the onset of the, the Donbass conflict, but arguably I think even before that, a deteriorating relationship with Russia around Russia's turn away from uh, the democracy and human rights agenda at the core of the OSCE and also Russia's involvement in various uh, other conflicts in the region, notably in, in the Russia-Georgia war, uh, but also in the Transnistria conflict. But uh, and then there's been a kind of a bilateral deterioration going on for several years. And you may recall that there was this um, incident in which Russia used chemical weapons on British territory, Salisbury. So the, the Ukraine relationship uh, needs to be seen in that much wider bilateral relationship between Russia and the UK, in which Russia has also been for many years uh, beginning to push the envelope on security. So flying Russian planes into British airspace, trying to bring Russian naval vessels uh, and, and so on into UK territorial waters and, of course, uh, cyber attacks. So beginning in 2014, the, the UK started to give additional assistance to Ukraine so that there was quite a substantial 
uh, military training package, Operation Orbital, uh, which uh, trained and helped, helped to modernize and adapt Ukrainian armed forces, which were in quite poor shape in 2014. And of course, what we see actually is uh, much of the success of the Ukrainian armed forces has been because of the tactics that they've adopted subsequently, you know, playing to their strengths, small units, uh, sort of light infantry, uh, working not in big formations and using these weapons that the UK and the US and others have provided to Ukraine in, in recent, uh, recent months, uh, just ahead of the conflict and increasingly during the conflict. We also saw the UK offering quite a lot of other uh, assistance that there's been a developing relationship between Ukraine and the UK around uh, modernizing and, and really updating and almost creating from, from zero a Ukrainian Navy because much of the Ukrainian Navy was, was taken when the Russians annexed Crimea or it was very old. So that, that's also going, going forward. And then in response to the, to the Russia's attack on Ukraine uh, this year, the UK has um, uh, been, well, obviously providing weapons, but also taking a very strong line, as you mentioned, on sanctions, uh, economic sanctions coordinated with the US, EU, Canada and others, but also trying to target the Russian money in London uh, with these so-called oligarchs, most famously, of course, the, the, uh, the for former owner, I guess, now of, of Chelsea Football Club, but many others. Uh, stepping away from uh, buying oil from, on the Russian markets, but also sharing intelligence with uh, the Ukrainians on the Russian movements, and then sort of being part of the wider global diplomacy around the Ukraine crisis through uh, G7, NATO, working with um, the EU, but also in its bilateral ties. So, so all that I think has been coming together and. Uh, this reflects the UK's assessment, which, which actually we saw in, in the Integrated Review of Foreign Security Policy, which came out last spring, that the UK has seen now Russia as being a major state-based threat to the UK for, for, for quite some years. And I would even say that you saw the UK using active deterrence off the, uh, the waters of Ukraine around Crimea, where the UK put a, a, one of its naval vessels transiting those waters, which now, of course, Russia claims last year, uh, and that caused a lot of consternation in Russia. So it, it's, it's a sort of a deep-seated uh, and broad relationship uh, to Ukraine that reflects that wider UK perspective on Russia. Thank you very much. Um, Mikhail, I'd like to go back to, uh, to, to you and uh, because uh, Zelensky, uh, the Ukrainian president, talked to the Italian parliament today and uh, uh, there is no doubt that it's, his image has quite um, uh, improved after, after the start of, uh, of the war. Um, what can you tell us about uh, this uh, fascinating character? You've written a lot about about the president and uh, his um, uh, like his evolution into into a, a politician. Uh, he was a, a former comedian. Uh, so, how do you assess uh, his role in this uh, latest episode of the conflict? Well, there's definitely a Zelensky factor in everything that happens in the recent month in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky himself has lived through different stages, and we can say we, we saw Zelensky as a different personality in the past, as a showbiz uh, manager, as a comedian, as a president in peace, we, to which we could have a lot of questions and doubts about efficiency of his presidency. But when the war started, he showed courage, unusual wisdom, and uh, he created an additional trust in the society, to government, to his administration, that resistance can prevail. Well, this factor is one of the miscalculations that Kremlin had. I also can see that in the West, many were expecting President Zelensky to leave Ukraine. There were many offers for him to, to do so and stay in safe place somewhere in the West. But Zelensky stays in Kyiv. Uh, he there's reportedly uh, almost every day an attempt uh, of his murder, and he goes on and he leads the nation in probably the most difficult situation that we lived in our 30 years. 
This is also, uh, it marks a, a, a great difference uh, with uh, what Yanukovych did, right? The former president of Ukraine during Absolutely. the Euromaidan, he left basically. Yeah, uh, th there's a definitely that Zelensky is very different from two previous presidents. Yanukovych with the first threat, we, we don't even know how realistic this threat was to his uh, life or health. But he left uh, Kyiv just because of some information. And then we have President Poroshenko, who was also a very different president. And he, he was leading Ukraine in 2014 when the first part of this war started in Donbas and with the annexation of Crimea. And uh, Poroshenko did not show the same leadership spirit. So today Zelensky is really a very important part of the resistance culture that uh, is growing very fast. And it, it inspires both defenders of the sieged cities, uh, people who are uh, not leaving Ukraine and staying in Western parts. And you know that it's al almost 7 million people who left their houses, but stay in, in the West uh, of Ukraine. So uh, for, for all these people, defenders, civilians, Zelensky, is very important to believe in future. Two days ago, there was a poll published showing that 93% of Ukrainians believe uh, in future and in uh, resolution of this war uh, with the benefit for Ukraine. Well, certainly uh, his skills um, as a communicator, as an actor, did help uh, him to, to achieve this uh, remarkable result. Uh, Neil, um, you've worked for uh, many international organizations, among which there is the OSCE, uh, which played a, a pivotal role, I think, well, maybe not a pivotal, but extremely important role in this conflict since uh, 2014. And yet, in uh, this latest um, aggression, we have seen uh, the role of uh, international organizations uh, somewhat diminished. Uh, so what role do you think uh, international organizations can play both in the uh, um, P uh, ceasefire agreement and in the post-conflict uh, uh, rebuilding of, of the country? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I mean, European security was really built around multilateral organizations uh, in the post-Soviet period. The OSCE was, was the broadest one and there was a vision of European security stretching from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Uh, which was supposed to bring all of the uh, of the NATO countries together with the former Warsaw Pact countries together in the new European security framework. And then, of course, we also had European Union and NATO as core frameworks there. But the OSCE really embodied the principles of European security, the shared framework. And so it's been very useful, obviously, in trying to guide countries, particularly in the East, I would say, as they moved away from the communist system, but it, it, it's lost its relevance as Russia has rejected many of those principles. And of course, most dramatically, of course, with the with the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, Russia violated the core foundation of OSCE principles, namely the territorial integrity of states, in which you, you can't change the borders of states uh, without mutual agreement. So, of course, if Ukraine had been willing to see that land, that would have been different. But but, but doing it by force or by aggression. So uh, the OSCE, of course, has struggled uh, in that context. Nonetheless, it, it does continue to play an important role. We, as you mentioned, it's been since 2014 or 2015, there's been an OSCE monitoring mission around the Donbass uh, conflict, which, which has been really important in trying to bring some transparency into what, what's been going on there, notably what, what Russia has been doing to support uh, the Russia-backed uh, forces in Donbass. And even in the lead up to the current war, uh, the OSC was used by, by Ukraine to try and call out Russia's buildup of forces because the OSC is also the home for, for European arms control. And so Ukraine uh, demanded that Russia explain, in, in according to the Vienna document, which is a document about military exercises, what Russia was doing, building up these vast forces around Ukraine. So, so it, it does retain a, a relevance there. But I, I think overall, what the crisis has done is it, it's been a, a big challenge to multilateralism in general. And perhaps we can talk a bit about that, what this means for the future of European security. 
there, there must be a question mark now about the OSCE's future, uh, given what Russia has done. Uh, and uh, But on the other hand, of course, NATO and, and the EU may have got a renewed sense of purpose, a, a renewed focus on their core mandates, which may mean that they, they're going to play a much more important role in, in European security in the years ahead. Uh, another question. Um, Russia left uh, the Council of Europe and uh, uh, does it really change uh, anything for, for Russians? Because even when Russia was a member, um, the uh, decisions of the court weren't really implemented, right? So what do you think uh, will be the effect of, of this decision for ordinary Russians? Well, as you say, I mean, R Russia has been stepping away from, from the Council of Europe and it, it even changed its constitution last, I think it was last year, to, to say that Russian laws were superior. And, and so it sort of asserted its, do its dominance, its judicial dominance over, over the Council of Europe. But, but it has played an important role because I think it's in two areas. First of all, it has actually been an arena in which uh, Russian citizens, for example, particularly around the Chechen conflicts, could bring those issues uh, to a wider audience and the Russian state was forced to actually defend its policies uh, and uh, you know, when the decisions went against it to sort of accept those decisions. So it was actually an important mechanism for individuals, including seeking for compensation sometimes. And secondly, it did mean that Russia was part of a community of states committed to rule of law and democracy and so uh, I think there was a certain socialization value, at least an embarrassment factor that Russia had to face up to and explain to those states what it was doing. Having now left the council, of course, both those things have changed. And, and this is now the risk that Russia is increasingly an isolated, inward looking uh, authoritarian, if not increasingly dictatorial regime under President Putin, uh, where individuals have little alternative the, but to leave, and we've seen that is you know, there's been a mass migration, I think, of, of many of the most talented people in Russia in recent months around the conflict. Neil, you have already started talking about the uh, the, the future of uh, the European security order. So my last question would be for the both of you. Um, while it's too early, of course, to make um, um, assessments and predictions, but you know how. How do you evaluate uh, the, um, the, the, the the possible reconfigurations of the uh, European uh, security order after the conflict? What are the main uh, impacts as seen uh, from the UK and from uh, your uh, perspective? Mikhail, you, you go first. Thank you, Lenore. Well, what I see is that Europe becomes even more divided. Right now, we definitely have an iron curtain that stretches again between Russia, Belarus on one side and Central and Western uh, Europe in the, in the West. But uh, Ukraine remains the field, the country, the space uh, of contestation. And uh, well, my heart and my thoughts are with my parents, with my daughter, with my relatives and friends there. But I understand that this geopolitical dimension plays a crucial role in the future. So the talks between Moscow and Brussels, Moscow and Washington DC, Moscow and London is very important also to settle the conflict between these nations and help uh, Ukraine to restore Ukraine's integrity, uh, Ukraine's sovereignty, and also heal the wounds that this war is bringing to us. Neil, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, European security has been going through a transformation for some years. I mean, we've had issues such as Brexit, the UK leaving the EU, uh, the rise of China. Uh, these have all raised big questions about the future of Europe. I think what the, the Ukraine crisis has done is it's, uh, as Mikhail says, of course, there's now a big risk of a, of a division between uh, Europe and, um, and countries to the east. Uh, but on the European side, there is a consolidation of, of NATO, which some people thought had lost its way. I mean, that's now, I think, back at the center of European security, uh, of collective defense. And we're going to see quite a, probably a shift uh, of NATO, the NATO summit this June in Madrid, an adoption of a new strategic concept, 
which will put Russia at the core of that, uh, increased defense spending, uh, Western forces are much more deployed to, to the eastern flank. And at the same time, you've seen the EU stepping up, but it, they announced their strategic compass yesterday. But and that accepted, I think, the, the central role of NATO as the core of collective defense, but the EU playing complementary roles. So we've got you know, quite an effective division of labor now between EU and NATO uh, on European uh, def uh, defense and security. The key challenge, I think, is now going to be how to work with countries like Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, uh, South Caucasus, and maybe even Central Asia. Uh, hopefully, the, the conflict in Ukraine will come to a, a, well, a peaceful conclusion at some point, but then we're going to continue to have difficulty with Russia. So how are we going to actually manage Russia uh, and help Ukraine to rebuild and actually strengthen its own deterrence so this doesn't happen again? Well, definitely we're seeing uh, a great uh, degree of unity among European member states at the moment. But uh, seen from here in Italy, there is a concern that this unity will fade away uh, when the effects of sanctions uh, will uh, hit uh, member states very hard and some members are more vulnerable uh, than others and Italy is one example which is uh, I mean is we're very dependent on on Russian gas so um, we'll see how uh, this factor will play out in the in the future we're about to finish but I've got um, a question um, probably to Mikhail uh, from uh, Mirella, she would like to know the key elements of the various negotiations carried out uh, to resolve the conflict so far. Um, uh, what are we talking about? What are Russia's demands and what is Ukraine uh, uh, likely to accept? Well, there's definitely several packages of questions that are being discussed right now in these consultations and future talks. Well, first of all, it's neutrality of Ukraine. And as I, saw, uh, as I said before, there is some room for uh, negotiations. If there are strong guarantees for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, then there is uh, also a, a perspective on that way. But uh, there's also an issue of cultural issues, or as Kremlin puts it, denazification, ideological and cultural issues. And here it's really a, a part of... Uh, of propagandist uh, toolkit, and uh, I can hardly imagine that diplomats can seriously discuss these kind of issues. However, they are constantly uh, brought up by Kremlin. And another separate package, which is very important and which is probably the most uh, pro problematic, is recognition of the territories uh, and communities that demand their separate independent existence with these self-proclaimed republics uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk. This is close to impossible, uh, as well as recognition of the uh, Ru Russian uh, control over Crimea. And in that uh, part, President has already said several days ago about the possibility of refer holding referendum, but how that there's a question, how can you hold referendum in the conditions of war with so many refugees. So here, I, I think that we will have the most heated and problematic debates and the consultations. Well, um, we'll definitely follow uh, the uh, diplomatic developments. Um, we're uh, ending here uh, on time. Uh, so um, thank you so much to the both of you uh, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, thank you, everyone watching at home. And uh, um, see you next time. Hopefully we'll be able to discuss uh, more uh, about peace rather than, uh, than war. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi.